extraordinary acts of courage and endurance on the part of surveyors and construction gangs when working in the rugged, mountainous terrain. Complex political manoeuvrings occurred in Wellington and Auckland, and delicate negotiations were carried out with Maori tribes whose ancestral lands were to be traversed. Sacrifices were made by immigrant labourers working on the railway. We explore the problems in constructing the great viaducts and the unique Raurimu spiral. As early as 1878, no route through the middle of the North Island, linking the King Country with the rest of the line, had been seriously considered. It was, however, outlined in the Railways Construction Act to authorise construction of a Wellington to Foxton line and one from Te Awamutu to New Plymouth. The passing of the North Island Main Trunk Railway Loan Act in 1882 authorised the raising of £1 million. This made it possible to review early exploration in 1874 by Carruthers and Mackay. In 1882, J.F. Sickley was instructed to explore the plains between Waiuru and Ohakuni. The need was then apparent in 1883 that all proposed routes should be explored and authority was issued for four survey parties to investigate the following routes from Te Awamutu to Hastings, from Te Awamutu to Taranaki via Taupo or more central to Martin or Fielding. In that same year, Charles Hursthouse carried out a general appraisal of the country for its suitability for a railway between Te Awamutu and Stratford. So did well-known surveyor John Rochefort. He chose a more central route from Martin to Te Awamutu via the Pariwa, Rangitike and Hautapu rivers. Rochefort, known for his professional technical skill and physical endurance, produced plans of his survey with barometric levels and a precise traverse and level survey of the route which in general the railway now follows. He unwisely exaggerated that the descent from the central plateau, a 1 in 70 grade and 9 chains in length, was possible at a cost of £5,000 per mile. Early 1887 saw the first attempt made by R. A. Brown and G. R. Berry by keeping to the west of Rochford's line, getting down off the plateau into the Raurimu stream to the Pio Pio Tia Valley, which is the present site of the Raurimu station. This line continued down the Makaritu stream, then turned west into the Pukarimu stream. This line was finally abandoned at the head of the Raurimu stream at a level of 2,422 feet. A 1 in 70 gradient was run down the Whakapapa Valley into the Whanganui Valley at Kākahi and then on to Taumanui. This trial line was also rejected. That left only one more option. In 1887, J. Barton Brown and C. B. Turner made the first attempt to find a 1 in 50 trial line down the Pio Pio Tia Valley. This development included nine viaducts with a total length of 4,300 feet, twice that of which now exists on the descent from National Park to Ohakuni, and the cost was prohibitive. Several other trial lines were investigated but were not taken seriously. From the impressive amount of work involved in these trial surveys from Rochefort, Brown and Berry, and Brown and Turner, emerged the disturbing fact that the railway over the central plateau was going to involve the government in expenditure of a magnitude not previously conceived. Two further surveys were authorised in 1888 for alternative routes through Taranaki, and at the same time work was suspended at the northern railhead where the Porita Rail Tunnel was being constructed and the southern railhead from Martin to Kakariki ended. One of the alternative routes through Taranaki was explored by James Blackett. This proceeded northeast from Waitara along the coast and up the Mimi River Valley to the head. From there it crossed the intervening ranges into the Tangarakau Valley. This line was exceedingly costly and needed further consideration. The second trial line was explored by R. W. Holmes, who realised that the central route possessed financial, political and practical advantages not to be found previously. Mayors of Martin, Fielding, Whanganui, Palmerston North and Wellington, in association with members of Parliament, on the 17th of October 1898, urged immediate attention to deteriorating labour and Maori land issues, as progress had slowed dramatically. By the year 1900, resident engineer J.D. Loach and 800 English, Australian and New Zealand navvies assembled their tents and huts, wherever possible amid the dense bush and mud surrounding Raurimu. Soon after, a workman's hall, billiard saloon, stores, post office and a school appeared to support their family social needs. Progress from the northern stretch of the main trunk had crossed the watershed between the Mokau and Whanganui river systems. The great success of the Porotorau Tunnel, 53 chains long, and the Waititi Viaduct placed the railhead at the Ongaru Bridge crossing just north of Taumanui. 
From the south came the long-awaited completion of the Makahini Viaduct and the Pofakaroa Tunnel with the railhead at Mangaweka and the completion of the Toitoi Toi Viaduct. Meanwhile at Raurimu, the first shift of navvies prepared to mount what was to become the greatest achievement in New Zealand Railways history. Progress had already begun from the Waimarino to Raurimu section down the Makaretu stream. At this point, a further 40 chains of 7 and one half chain reverse curvature at a right angle to the line descended 40 feet lower into the Pio Pio Tia Valley. From here, a continuous grading at 1 and 50 for over a mile reaches the first major landfill, the well-known cinder bank. A staggering 110 foot gradient plunged a further 50 feet into the mountainous terrain. An almost perfect circle is scribed, bringing the gangs to the first of the two tunnels. Weather conditions of rain, snow and icy blasts came from the central mountain group, including Ruapehu, Narahoe and Tongariro, and only the best men could work in the tunnels, the uppermost of which was 316 feet long and the lower 1,262 feet in length. Ingeniously constructed was a wooden Chinaman earth hopper with horse-drawn tip cuts on tracks which transported loose earth and rock from the total of 10 cutaways to several high-fill connections. Exiting the lower tunnel leading north, a seven and one-half chain curve west with heavy cuts and fills for one mile reduced the elevation 100 feet, heading the line in a southeasterly direction along the siding above. There was sufficient distance ahead to grade down to the extreme south end of the Raurimu flat. The alignment then describes a clockwise semicircle called the horseshoe to make a northerly approach to the proposed station yard. This became the Raurimu station. Good teamwork of the field parties would undoubtedly have contributed greatly to the ingenious solution to a unique quest, making Robert Holmes perhaps the greatest location engineer in New Zealand railway history. A-class locomotive on the Raurimu spiral was a magnificent sight to behold. The beauty of dawn in the central plateau sees KA941 in June of 1967 pulling a work train. The same morning sees JB1205 and DA1511 lead a northbound goods train into National Park. The DA-class locomotives were soon to take over completely, leaving the KAs to struggle on.
JB1205, one of the few coal burners converted to burn fuel oil, majestically leads the DA and train down towards the spiral. Thankfully, 10 of 90 locomotives of her class are being restored by enthusiasts. Now on the spiral, the train travels down the second level, through the tunnels, descending the straight down towards the Horseshoe Curve, through Raurimu Station, north towards Taumaranui. Three months later, we capture what was to be the last KA on the spiral, as KA 945 charges out of Talmanui with a rail fan special. KA 945 is one of five of her class to have been saved and traversed the same track 18 years later with JA 1250 on the 1985 Steam Centennial. In the meantime, let's relive the day trip as we head towards Raurimu.
As the train makes the final climb towards the spiral, we witness the sight and sound of the KA, a scene beautifully summed up by the late Peter Baker on the day, the 30th of September, 1967. The steam engine hard at work, up, battling up parades and magnificent scenery, and this is for the last time ever, ever in probably the history of mankind, that the steam locomotive will come up this stretch of line. Actually, we're just below the spiral, John, and it comes in here and it's travelling properly due south and then it will climb up the spiral and actually travel all towards all points of the compass before it gets to the top of the spiral. Features of the spiral unfold as the train begins the 1 in 50 grade of the horseshoe, up through the cuttings, as we head towards the lower tunnel, up over the cinder bank, around and out towards National Park.
National Park and we're at the top of the spiral, the end of the spiral section, it's commonly known as the end of the spiral section, we've travelled just barely, well we've travelled about seven and a half miles I think to do about one and a half miles in a straight line, something like that, it's a roundabout way of getting there but we've had to get up onto the high plateau. In the days of pick and shovel, not only that, uh, the surveyors, uh, the surveyors of, of, of today recognise this as being the only well, it's the only way that the spiral could have been built, the road could the route could have been put through. I see. Now here's the engine coming back, Peter. Mm, Just describe yes. it going past. Well, it's a magnificent sight. A really magnificent sight. Sight and sound you'll never see again. Whirling rods and uh, just a magnificent sight, it really is. There's something about a black bag made it nice and clean with a red buffer beam and a white number looks very, very nice indeed. Another special trip for enthusiasts was run in July 1972 with unique sequences. Sit back and view the journey to National Park and a cab return to Raurimu Station. dieselization of the main trunk line took place in 1968. Relax now and enjoy the scenic daylight express being hauled up the spiral by a DA class locomotive. Unusual graphic sequences captured here by film cameraman Jack Ma.
One man who drove trains on the spiral for many years is Murray McElwain. He recalls his experiences. Yeah, it brings back memories to me of one of the things that a driver of an express train never wants to repeat, and that is the stalling or the stopping of an express train on a hill. The engine, the train was uh, 227 southbound. The locomotive was KA 951. I cannot recall to mind right now my fireman at the time, but in 1964 65, when this incident happened, steam engines were allowed to run down in maintenance. And they, the rings on the cylinders or the pistons in the cylinders on this locomotive weren't the best. And as I'd come out of the smaller tunnel, the engine went into a slip. And she slipped a couple of times. I managed to get it back on its feet. That stopped the wheels from slipping. But I'd lost momentum, which meant there was more drag on the locomotive. And she just slowly pulled herself to a standstill. And I had the regulator open, right, right open, reversing lever out past the block, and she was just sitting there on the hill, going nowhere. She's got all she could have, full head of steam to the point of howling off, and she was sitting there. And all you could hear was a big <laughs> roaring noise as the steam shot past the cylinder rings, the piston rings, out through the chummy. Anyway, we carried out the regulations that we're supposed to do, and they decided to, um, because we were so late, they sent the northbound express down from Raurimu to rescue us. And uh, he came down, hooked onto the front of us. Uh, he propelled a LA wagon, which was a small metal wagon, in the front of the other K, or the KA locomotive, to hook onto the front of us because two KA locomotives front to front would not meet because of the cow catcher and there used to be a drawbar of about half a metre long that they used to fit into the buffers when they were being towed around the sheds but because none of these were available at that hour of the night they came down with this LA wagon on the front hooked onto us and the other K engine assisted us up the hill so that was really um, embarrassing to the point that uh, well, it was just sheer embarrassing to, for an express engine driver to stall on the hill. Uh, another thing that I can relate to virtually at the same point, there was a cinder bank. The, everyone knew it as a cinder bank. It was a dumping ground for ashes. There used to be tons and tons of ashes that were produced by uh, the coal-burning locomotives and this was one of the places where they used to dump them. And one of the reasons I was told that they used to dump ashes on a heavy cutting, as you will probably see in the video of the spiral, was it used to allow water to seep through it. And it wouldn't log or hold water back. It would retain its pressure. It would retain its, its uh, standing stability but would allow water and moisture to travel through it. Then as you went further south up the spiral, you came to the point of the mantelpiece. And that in itself was quite frightening that when you were on a, uh, a locomotive, you could look straight down and virtually you were looking straight down into the creek. As you went up past the hump, you straightened up and you then become level with the number one main highway which went over the top of the rower line and as it went to the left hand side of the train there is a road on the left hand side of the track now that road is the original coach road that the rower at the coach road used to come down before they put the bridge over the top of the spiral over the top of the track it used to come down on the left hand side of the train track 
it would then cross the line before the hump and then you see these concrete abutments where there was a bridge that the coach road used to go over and it then used to cut through the bush and would used to go across the railway line just slightly uphill of the intermediate signal which is there on the spiral now and I can still think of the days of the steam when the locomotives were hand fed of the trials and tribulations of the steam engines going up there under firing conditions, not oil burning conditions it must have been real hell at times for those older drivers and firemen but uh, you can't beat the satisfaction of sitting in a diesel locomotive and doing that track or sitting in the cab of a diesel electric like the Silver Fern rail car.
final construction of the Raurimu spiral consisted of two tunnels, ten cuttings, five embankments, one long and two wide U-loops. This necessitated a continuous 360 degree twist to reduce the 234 feet of altitude in a direct line of three miles, but a rail distance of seven miles, giving a steady uncompensated grade of one and fifty through seven curves of seven and one half chains radius, totaling some 1100 degrees of curvature. This is hard enough to say. Imagine how hard it was to do. The Spiral, New Zealand's finest railway engineering accomplishment. An ingenious solution devised last century, and one not better to this very day.